That's okay. And tonight we are going to just be talking about data entry, how to do it. And Kaylin and Mike have lots of tips and tricks to share. Uh, before we really get into it, though, I do would I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, I am currently coming to you from just outside of Point Pelee National Park, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, composed of the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Specifically, this is the home of Caldwell First Nation and part of the House of Waffle Island First Nation. Uh, we acknowledge the caregivers of this land and all the moccasins that have traveled it over time. So. Tonight, we are going to learn some tips and tricks for data entry. Um, I know we have some deadlines coming up, right, guys, that we need to meet. So um, Mike and Kaylin are going to take over from me and um, give you some pointers on how to get all this data entry done in the time frame that would be ideal. Um, and they're willing to entertain questions on data entry and anything else you might want to ask tonight about the Atlas project. So I'm going to pass it over to you guys. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and if you've got any questions, you should be able to put them in the Q and A if you're on um, if you're on Zoom and if you're on uh, Facebook watching us on Facebook, then you should be able to put it in the comments and we'll be monitoring those as well. Um, so yes, we have our, our annual data entry deadline is coming up at the end of the month. So just over a week away. Um, it's not a hard deadline, as in we will happily accept data entered after that point. But we really, 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 really want you to get the data in, especially from peak period and special surveys like point counts. Uh, we really want to get that in before the end of the month because we need to go through our data review process this fall. And then we've only got two more summers left of data collection. So we really need to have everything nice and neat and ready to, to check out um, so we can do our planning over the course of the, the late fall and winter to prioritize where we need to get our coverage um, up a little bit uh, in our last two years. So we're really going to be trying to target our efforts over year four and five. And to do that, we need these data to be in the system and had a chance to be reviewed. So, so that's our plea. Please, please, please get your data in by the end of the month. Um, but you, if you have outstanding data from previous years, you can get that in as well. And we will happily accept um, data that does come in after that date. Um, so I'm going to switch over to doing sort of a, a live video. I'm going to do some some walkthroughs on and just sort of as a refresher for everybody, whether you're new um, to the Atlas or even if you're a pro, but you're you're looking for a refresher on how to enter your data. I'm going to walk us through how to do things on the website, and then I'm going to switch over to to Kaylin, and she's going to walk through how to do things using the mobile app. So give me a second here while I share my screen. Oh, screen two. All right, how's that? Kaylin, can you give me a thumbs up? Thanks. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, to get started on data entry, obviously you need to go to the Atlas website, uh, which, which you should be seeing here. Uh, that's birdsontario.org, if you've forgotten. Um, and then you need to log in, and that'll take us to the Nature Counts portal, which is where our data are housed. Um, and you'll see a screen like this, nice Canada warbler. Um, and I've already logged in. That's why you see me. I'm going to log out. So we go through the full process. So log in. It'll take you to the sign in screen. You have to put in your your username and password. Click sign in. And if you haven't signed in before, you can register as well. Um, and before I even get started with submitting data, I just want to show you one quick trick when, where it relates to eBird. So if you're not an eBird user, you can tune out, uh, maybe go get yourself a drink for the next 30 seconds or so. But for those of you who are eBird users, uh, most people want to know how to do this. So if you hover over your, your name and you click on it and click on your profile, it'll take you, you can scroll down to your eBird export settings. And this is where you put in your eBird login, your eBird password, 
you'd click update if you're putting in for the first time. And then the other thing to pay attention to is this guy right here, automatically push your nature counts data to eBird after entry. You can click set, click, um, you can select yes or no. If you're selecting yes, then any checklist that you submit into the Atlas will automatically, a copy of it will be sent over to your eBird account. If you click no, you can, and, and you save that in, as your setting, um, you can still do it, go in and, and share individual checklists one at a time, but it won't do it automatically. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is if you're changing this, when you do it, you need to put fill in your eBird username and password each time you change this setting. So once you've done that, you'd click Save Changes. Okay, so that's your how to set up your eBird settings. Now we're going to start with some, some data entry. So I'm going to click over Submit and click Submit Data. This is for general atlasing and for point counts. You would select this option. Our first step is pretty, pretty straightforward. You need to zoom in on the Atlas Square where you collected your data. So I'm going to use my mouse. If you've got a, wheel, a, a mouse with a wheel, you can use the wheel to zoom in wherever your cursor is or zoom out. Um, you can also use the little plus signs and minus signs in the bottom right. You can also toggle back and forth between map view and satellite view. I find it a little easier using satellite view if I'm trying to be really fine about where my location was, um, but it's really a personal preference. So I'm going to zoom in. And once you zoom in enough, it's going to switch you over to your squares. So now we're starting to see squares. Those are the red squares. That's the Atlas square. It'll pop up here and say current Atlas square is 18 TTQ 72. Um, if you knew the square, you could type it in with the find square option. It'll zoom you right to it. Once you've zoomed in on a square and you see the square boundary, you're going to see some points, perhaps. Um, if you see some of these reddish orange marks that have a little flame, those are eBird hotspots, um, which you can select. Uh, and then you might see some little blue pins. Those are your locations where you've already submitted an Atlas checklist from previously. So you could reuse the same point if if that's what you want to do. So once you've once you've uh, gotten this up, then you need to choose what kind of location you're going to create. You can pick a single location. So that's like the start of your route. Um, that could be a hotspot, a personal location, or create create a brand new spot. Um, you just click on a point on the map, it creates a new site, gives it a name, you can edit that there. Um, you can also enter a traveling location. So if I select that, then I'm going to be able to draw a line. So I could maybe I started here, went to that intersection, drove down a little ways, and then you double click when you want to end your route. Here's our line. And just like when we selected our a single location, it gave us a site name. You can change the name of that at this point as well. The third option is to draw a polygon. So draw an area where you covered. So this is handy if you covered perhaps, um, you know, maybe you walked around and covered the sewage lagoons here really well. So you draw your polygon and then once they connect up, it'll shade that area in. Same thing again, you can give it a, a location name. So those are our three main types of, of selecting a location. The fourth option is to, to use the entire square. So, so this is an option. We, we generally recommend you using a more precise option like the point, the, the, traveling locate, um, the traveling line or the polygon. But if you want to, you can use the entire location, the entire square. Um, so when you click that, it shades the entire square. These are okay, but they're not as, as good for us when it comes to data analysis because we can't tie your records to a specific place within the square. Even if you covered a big chunk of the square, it's more helpful to draw a line or an area or a point uh, in, that, in that part of the square than selecting the entire square. But it is an option if you can't be more precise. Once you select your, your observation type up here, you're going to select um your date that you made the observations so it's um there's the month is the drop down the year and the day um you can enter it manually in these three boxes i find it much easier to click on the little calendar icon and there you can scroll through the calendar and pick the date so let's say i was 
selecting May 13th of this year, um, you can do, go and do that. And it's important to remind everybody that you can go back and enter your records from previous previous dates, previous years even. Um, as long as it's within, within the Atlas period, we want those data. So if you've got some records in a notebook that you haven't got in from a couple of years ago, that's no problem. You can go back and, and enter it this way. Um, the next thing you're going to do is select your start time. And these is just our, so that's on this checklist, I start at 8 a.m. Oh, 8 zero, 0 And then a dur duration is how many minutes you spent out in the field. So this is 10 minutes. And then number of observers, how many people were with you. Um, I'm going to use just one, just myself. There is a manage observations option. This is completely optional. Um, but you can you can add additional observer names. Um, you have to manage those through your profile. But once you've added them in your profile, when you click manage observations, they'll be available just in a little checkbox like they are here. You can write in a, a name as well if it's just a one-time person. Um, if birding was not your primary purpose, if you were, say, driving down the highway and you happen to see something really interesting, you want to put it in the atlas, then you'd put it in here with uh, this incidental or this um, incidental checkbox, yes or no. Um, when you do that, it automatically selects no for this question way down here, which is, are you completing, are you reporting a complete checklist? We'll get to that in a second. I'm going to uncheck that. Um, and we did 10 minutes. And then distance and area, these things you can add. If you did cover a distance, you can put those in and same with area, but these are optional um, entries. Then we get down to, are you reporting a complete checklist? Um, yes or no. So basically the way to think about this one is, are you purposely excluding some species? Are you just reporting your highlights? Something like that. Um, in general, we, we much, much prefer you to put in complete checklists and answer yes, uh, but please only answer yes if that was indeed the case. So all the birds you are able to identify are in this this checklist. So I click yes. And then uh, we'll get to this one uh, on our next example, but this is if you're completing point counts, you click yes. Um, and and then there's this little checkbox at the bottom, the show point count locations. This is just handy while you're selecting your location. If you want to see where those point counts are on the square map, um, you can't select them at this point anyways, but they're they're useful to, to see them uh, kind of grayed out on the, the map as a reference. And down here at the bottom is the import from eBird. We'll cover that in a second as well. So we filled out all the necessary information. We've picked our location. We have uh, picked our date and start time, duration, number of observers. We've said it's a complete checklist. We're going to continue on to the next step. Now, the next step is is the fun part. We're going to enter our bird, um, our bird list. Um, so here you can um, search for a species if you don't want to scroll all the way through this, through the um, through the list. So I had black cap chickadee, black cap chickadee. There it is, and it pulls it up to the top of the list. So we had four black cap chickadees and then breeding evidence we had s and when you type in the breeding evidence code or start typing in the code it'll come up with the possible options that match that so s the only one that matches is singing that's the one we wanted so we've selected it then our next bird is song sparrow and we had one of those and this one was carrying food so I'm going to type C, and there's carrying food pops up. And then the next one is Eastern Meadowlark. There it is. And we had one of these as well. And this one was H, habitat. So here we've got our three species that I've entered so far, um, our counts, our breeding evidence codes, and there's this, there's two other columns that some people wonder about. The first one is the max BE. This is telling us what's the, the highest level of breeding evidence observed so far in this square in this atlas. So for the song sparrow, the previous high was A, agitated. 
Um, and this one, we've got CF. So we're actually upgrading the, the highest breeding evidence. The other two, we're, we're not vesting those ones. The other thing to pay attention here is we've got Eastern Meadowlark, um, which has the S, which is it's a, um, a species of interest. So it's a species that you might want to add some extra details for. If you want to add details, you click the little add details box. This is where you can write some notes. If you took some photos or made a video or audio, and you're going to put those in an eBird checklist that's linked, then you can put in here something along those lines that you have photo documentation. It'll be in the eBird um, checklist. If you're not going to put it in eBird or you don't have an eBird account and you have documentation for a rare species, you can just put in here that you have that and you can be contacted to, to get a copy from by the, the reviewer. You can also click the little coordinates tab along the top. And this is a spot where you can put the exact location. So if you knew where you had that metal arc, you could zoom in on the map I'm using the wheel again. And it was just over here, just west of those lagoons. So I've dropped, I've clicked the map, added a pin. Here it shows up, it add, automatically calculates the latitude and longitude. There was one there and that was H. Now, if you had multiple metal arcs, you could click other locations on the map and it'll add additional pins. Once you've finished with the description and the coordinates, click close and those will those will save for you. So the next thing that I would do is I would click submit. And there we go. We've submitted the checklist. Um, and in this case, I've got my auto sharing on with eBird. So it's the checklist has been shared with eBird. It gives me a link to the eBird checklist. I could open it up to check it out. Here we go. It looks basically the exact same, but the one big difference being that we've saved this, this exact location for the Eastern Metal Arc. Okay, so that's a quick run through on a, on a general atlasing checklist. Um, I'm going to quick show you how to do uh, some data entry with the website of point counts. So um, I'm going yep. to interject for two seconds because this is, this question is quite relevant for right now. Sure. And sure. this was just somebody made a comment that they noticed that if they draw the polygon in uh, greater than eight kilometers and push the checklist to eBird, it's invalidated in eBird. Is that correct? Let me read that question. A polygon. Uh, so, I, are you? Yeah, I'm, I'll have to. I'll have to look into that one a little further. Um, a polygon greater than eight kilometers, or a line. I, my guess is it's a line. eBird does have some uh, rules about maximum distances allowed, um, and that might be what's happening there. Um, if it's over a certain distance, then Eber, it's it's quite a bit higher than eight kilometers, I thought, though. Um, but yeah, if the, if you're over a certain amount of distance, Ebert automatically invalidates some checklists. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on what that cutoff is, and, and certainly not with the area for polygons. But I'll, I'll have to do some more digging on that one. Okay, um, point count. So Point counts are done through the same general um, tool. So I'm going to click, hover over submit and click submit data. And we're going to go through the exact same process. So I'm going to zoom in on the square that I did point counts in over here by Havelock again. Right. So there's the square I did our point, point counts in. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind with point counts using the web, the tool is optimized for entering multiple point counts all at once. So think of it as you're going out and you're doing a morning of, of point counts in a square. You can submit a single checklist using this tool. So it makes things a lot quicker because you only have to enter certain information once rather than every for every stop you made that morning. So you can select, um, you can draw like your route the traveling count perhaps. Um, this is where it's handy to click the show point count locations. So let's say I started at point count six, I drove up the road to seven, then one, then 13, 12, 14, 
and nine, and that's my root. So there's my morning. Um, I can give it a name if I wanted to, or just leave it as this, this um, default name. Um, you can also select, the easiest option is just to use the entire square. Um, you're gonna select the individual point counts you did on the next step anyways. But remember, that's, that's the trick with the point count entry that hangs some people up. You're not doing one spot at a time, one checklist at a time. You're doing like an entire morning at that square. You're doing it in a single checklist. So we've got our location. We're going to do it as this traveling traveling count. Uh, we have to pick our date. So we we'll go back and we did that on June 1st of this year. We started at 5 a.m. 5.05 to be precise. And we were out out for 70 minutes one observer it's already filled in our distance traveled which is pretty handy um now are you completing submitting a complete checklist of the birds you're able to identify yes in this one and did you complete atlas point counts this is the important one we have to click yes all right so now we're going to click continue and now we're going to select our point count station. So we did six, we did seven, we had one, we did 13, 12, four, and nine. So there we are, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven point counts. Here's the labels. So we did six, seven, one, 13, 12, four, and nine. So our first one was at 505. Our next point count, we started at 512. 520, 530, 538, 545, and then six o'clock for that last one. Okay, so we've got our start times for all of them. We've already entered the date, so we don't have to enter that again. And then we click continue, and it's going to give us uh, our data entry screen this time in batches of five. So here's our first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. We've got show point counts one to five up here. We had select six and seven to go to the next page. But here we've got our point count data um, split up between our first three minutes and our, our last two minutes for each of those five point counts. Um, and then we would add our numbers. So if we had a Canada goose on our first one and we had another Canada goose in the last two minutes of our fourth point count. And then we're going to, I'm going to scroll down here. Least flycatcher. We have two on this one, one on this one, one on this one. Now there's also, our, just like on our general atlasing checklist, there's a, a field for the account and a field for the breeding evidence. Um, the breeding evidence is our highest breeding evidence code uh, collected on this entire checklist. So of all those seven stops, as well as in between our stops, what was the highest breeding evidence we observed for Canada goose? We'd fill that in. What did I do? AE, adult entering a nest. And then there's also a room for an additional count. So this is where you would enter any Canada goose that you encountered between the point count stations. So maybe you saw uh, four Canada geese um, at a pond between point count stations, you'd add it here. And then our total is gonna show up as, as our total from that incidental kind of observations between stations, as well as any we recorded at point count stations. And then max BE is again, our maximum breeding evidence observed before this survey began. So we're upping the, the breeding evidence for this one again. I'm not gonna hit submit on this time because I haven't finished, but this is how you would go about it. Um, go through, do your five, and then you'd go through and do your next two. If you had even more than that, you'd, you'd take a few screens to do it, but five is, is how many we show you at once just to keep things more manageable. Okay, I'm gonna delete that checklist because I don't wanna submit it. And letting it delete. Knows I'm doing a presentation right now. Uh, 
Well, that's working. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you really quickly now how to do our other um, special survey data entry. This one is found under submit and hit special surveys. And here again, we need to zoom in to find our square that we conducted our special surveys in. I'm going to go back to that same square, Havelock square. And here we're going to see our point count stations. So I'm going to click on a station. So this is point number one in 18 TTQ 62.01. I'd click continue. And then this is where I select my date. So if it was 10th of March, 2023, um, and then I would pick which protocol I was using. So I was using an Eastern Screech Owl, click continue. And then you're gonna go through for this station, um, all your entries. So what time did you start? Uh, did you do your broadcast test? These are all specific fields related to that specific survey, um, but it should look very similar to the, the data entry form. So that's the main trick is finding how to get the, the th station started. You'd finish the form and then go on and enter your next station for that survey um, subsequently once, once you finish that one. All right, I'm going to delete that. And our last thing that I'm going to show you before I turn things over to Kaylin is how to do an eBird data import. So I'm just going to click quickly, click on and delete that one checklist that I entered. Where did it go? There it is. I'm gonna delete this one, that one I just entered. Okay, so I've deleted that form that I entered as our first example. Now I'm going to bring it in from eBird. So I'm kind of cheating because this checklist was actually originally from Nature Counts. So you have to go to your eBird checklist and find the checklist ID. So it's found in a few different places. Uh, it's found right above the date where it says checklist S14788, blah, blah, blah. That's your checklist ID. You can also find it in the URL of the checklist. So it's right up here. That's the same number. So you can copy and paste it from either place. So I'm going to highlight it. And then with my mouse, I'm going to right click it and copy. Now I'm going to go back here. And on this screen, I'm not even going to select my location. I'm going to hit import from eBird. And this is where I'm going to right click and click paste. There's my checklist ID. Import it from eBird. And it'll, it says, please wait. And it should have filled in all the information for me. So it's got the location selected. In this case, it was a, a square level checklist. So it's um, picking the very center of the square. It's got the single location. It doesn't, it doesn't know that it can bring in a, a square level checklist because eBird doesn't store that information. Um, so this one is coming in for the center point. It's got the date, the time, the duration, number of observers, distance, if it was there. All this information is coming straight from eBird. You just need to double check that it's correct. Hit continue. And then you should be able to see your birds on this list. I'm going to click only show species with data to quickly see those ones. And so here are my here are my species that were on that list. Four chickadees, one song sparrow, one eastern meadowlark. Um, S, C, F, and H are the breeding evidence codes. I've lost the pin. eBird does not store that. Um, but that's fine. If, if you were collecting your data in the first place in eBird, that would make sense. Um, any of the comments that you added would be copied over. Um, and this is where you need to double check that the, those things are correct, but also add any extra comments. If it was a rare species or if you wanted to add pins, you could do that now. So I'd click submit. And it's going to bring it in and it's still linked to that same eBird checklist. So it's real simple. Uh, you just need to know how to get that checklist ID uh, and it'll bring it in for you. So that was not as quick as as maybe it could have been, but um, that's um, a quick walkthrough of the different data entry techniques 
um, when you're using the, the website data entry. So I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kaylin to walk through the mobile data entry, and then we'll have lots of time for, for questions. Um, we can go back through any particular thing. Okay, go ahead, Kaylin. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and so, yeah, uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A um, on Zoom or in the chat on Facebook, um, and we'll be going over them at the end of this. So, um, okay. okay, you're seeing that all right? Hopefully. Yeah, looks good. Great. Um, thank you. All right, um, and so I guess my biggest tip um, for anyone who has questions about data entry um, or really anything Atlas related is that we do have a lot of really great videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, so I put the link at the bottom, it's youtube.com slash at Owen Bird Atlas. Um, but if you just search YouTube for Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas or Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas 3, you should see our channel. Uh, we have our logo there, so you'll be able to find us, uh, same in the top sector. Um, all of our sappy hours are, of course, recorded, and they're put on our YouTube channel. And then we have Atlas tutorials for how to enter uh, data uh, using the web, uh, using the app, um, among other things. Uh, so yeah, just keep that in mind. I know that sometimes, especially these sappy hours, can feel like they go by really quickly, um, and it's a lot of information to take in. Uh, so if you ever want to watch um, the Sappy Hours back, um, you can go to our YouTube channels. You have the um, added benefit of being able to pause and rewind, uh, which obviously you can't do something that's live. So do keep that in mind. Um, make sure you check out our YouTube channel if you have any questions or feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we're obviously happy to answer questions with you. So that is my biggest tip of the night, but I will go on to tell you a bit more about the app as promised. Uh, so the Nature Counts app, uh, it's available on both the Android, um, Play, Android, no, Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Um, so you'll have to look for Nature Counts, it's all one word. Uh, once you've downloaded it, um, it will ask you to sync the data, which you have to do when you first download. Uh, so what is updating versus syncing data? Um, so updating the app will give you the latest software uh, with uh, new features and bug fixes. So you always want to make sure that your app is up to date in order for it to run smoothly. Uh, some folks end up having uh, issues with the app, but it turns out that it just needed a little bit of an update. So keep that in mind. Uh, there is then uh, the option of syncing data. So you might get this warning that says, um, do you want to sync your data? Uh, so syncing data, make sure that all the backend uh, data is correct. So point count locations, uh, breeding evidence codes for species um, and safe dates. So you don't have to sync your data when it gives you this option. You can press not now. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that you need to sync the data before you can submit a checklist. And so if you go to submit your checklist and it says, well, you need to sync your data to do that. Um, if you don't want to sync your data at that moment, then you'll have to save your checklist as a draft um, and then submit it later. So um, you still have that option to save it as a draft and sync it later, um, but just keep in mind that you won't be able to submit until you sync the data. All right, uh, now that that is kind of over with, we can actually get into the meat of submitting data through Nature Counts. Uh, so the checklist set setup is the same as in previous versions of the app if you've used the app previously. Um, it has gotten a bit of a facelift, but um, the, that is still the same. So. Um, the app will automatically fill in the current date and time. So uh, obviously this was earlier today, August 22nd at 1.30. Um, and so it, it automatically selects your date and time uh, that is current as well as your current location. So um, obviously at this point in the summer, you're likely submitting historical data, historical as in from last month maybe, um, but what we want to do is we'll want to change the date and time and then um, nature counts is going to ask us if we're still at the same location because of course if you're submitting a checklist from last month it could be from anywhere it's not necessarily true that you're submitting it from where you are right this moment so um, for data entry after the fact you change the date and time so that's what i'm doing in this recording here um, and then the app asks you to confirm where the outsing took place so you can see at the bottom um, once i get rid of that. Um, it says, please confirm your location. 
Uh, so you'll just want to press on that edit location button um, and you can either just confirm that you are where you are right now or you can change it, um, change your location to somewhere else. Uh, so the protocols that are visible will vary depending on the time of year. So again, this is just from today. We're showing the general atlasing, atlas point counts, night jar surveys because they just finished, um, and then the long-eared owl survey. So um, in the springtime, early spring, um, other owl surveys will appear in the uh, protocols list. Uh, but because obviously it's late in the year now, we don't have those on there anymore. It's just to keep the list short so you're not scrolling through all kinds of protocols to try to find what you're for. And again, just a reminder uh, to check your location and um, also to select point count stations when you're completing point counts or special surveys. Uh, so one question we get a lot of um, is, okay, I submitted a point count through the app, but it's not showing up on the square summary sheet that I did it. Um, and that's because um, your location will only snap to a point count location if you're within 50 meters of that point count. So say I drive up to a point count station, I'm 52 meters away from that point count station and I just say, okay, Atlas point count and I press start and I go ahead. It's not going to automatically know that you're at point count number one, for example, if you're 52 meters away, our limit is 50 meters. And so one way to avoid that, one way to avoid being a little bit too far, well, you know, obviously you wanna make sure that you're as close as possible to the point, but um, if you press that edit location button, uh, you can actually manually select um, which point count station you're at. So A, if you want to go back and input your point counts through the app. So, you know, go back to June 1st and say you're at point count number one. You can press edit location and you can select those um, point count stations. Manually. So uh, this is what it'll look like when you press edit location. Um, and so you'll see all the point counts uh, for your general area. You can obviously scroll around as needed. And then once you select the point count station that, you wanna, um, that you're want that you looking to submit data at, um, it'll show uh, at the bottom. So you see the bottom right there, it shows the square number and then the point count number. So that's how you know that you've selected everything and you can press select location and it'll choose that point count station for you. So uh, in terms of actually um, entering the data, um, adding breeding evidence uh, and uh, and number of a species and number of individuals of a species, uh, you just click on the plus in each of those respective columns. So BE stands for breeding evidence and total uh, is the total number of individuals that you saw. Um, and so you just click on in each of those columns in order to add them. Uh, so you can see here, I click on the BE column and that's how I can change the breeding evidence from H to ME and from ME back to H. A second. <laughs> um, and you can also change the breeding evidence view from grid view to list view uh, if you're not sure what um, the letters mean. Uh, this will just give the uh, the name of the breeding evidence code. So P for pair, D for display, H for habitat, and so on. Uh, you, there are breeding evidence warnings. Uh, so this is for Canada goose. You can see that there's different shades of red, yellow, um, or you know most of the most of the breeding evidence codes are uh, white squares. Um, and so these are warnings, and it's because some breeding evidence codes are unusual for certain species. And so if you can imagine a Canada goose singing, for example, it's uh, not something that you're probably going to experience. So it'll give you a warning. This species does not produce sounds specifically associated with breeding. So you're not gonna catch a, a Canada goose singing to attract a native horse. Um, and so there are a variety of different breeding evidence codes. Some are just cautions. Um, you know, are you sure this is what you're seeing? Um, and some are more warnings, such as obviously singing geese. Oops. Sorry, that's my dog blinking. Um, okay, so uh, the app has also now incorporated um, the safe breeding dates. So you might know the safe breeding dates chart that uh, I'm showing here, uh, this uh, graphic here. But now uh, the Nature Counts app has incorporated those safe dates. So um, for American Robin, for this date that I had selected, it's not current date. Um, obviously, it's after August 17th, but um, you are within the safe breeding dates from April 15th to August 17th. 
Um, but if you're outside of the uh, safe date, so uh, for example, the nut hatch, if you're um, you know, in early April, you're gonna get a caution that uh, during this period, both breeders and migrants may be present. Uh, so this is when you want to limit the use of the possible breeding codes like H or S, uh, because some individuals might sing, for example, on migration. Uh, you can click on that little learn more um, information button, and it will give you um, a, a more detailed description of when the safe dates are, um, and just a little bit more about what this caution means. So for species totals, um, typically you press the plus under the total column in order to add one single individual at a time. So if you press it, they'll go one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is obviously really tedious uh, if there's a lot of individuals of a species. Uh, you don't want to press it a hundred times, for example. So you can press and hold in the total column and it will bring up your keyboard and you can either backspace, um, you know, so I press number two, okay, and then if you have a long press hold, you can erase it, uh, but you can also press and hold in order to type in 100, for example, instead of pressing it 100 times. Um, another way to um, add individuals of a species um, is to let make accounts do the math for you, um, and so if you type a number and then either a species code or a species name, and then tap in the total column, it will add that number for you. So I started out with um, with two Canada geese here, and then I said six Canada geese, and now there's eight. And we're doing the same thing with trumpeters once here. So we're adding four trumpeters once. So again, this will work for the four letter codes as well as the full PC names. Another uh, press and hold function is to press and hold on a species name in order to clear the species entirely. So right now we have the H code and two individuals for Canada geese. Um, I think. Um, right. Oh, if I press and hold on Canada goose, hopefully the video is actually playing this time. Yep. It'll say that, uh, do you want to clear a species? And you press clear, and then it will get rid of the breeding evidence and the number of indiv individuals from that species. Okay, don't forget, uh, Mike talked about this as well, but pinning species locations. So um, if you have a species of interest, so regionally rare, provincially rare, or otherwise significant, um, then you can pin species. I might just go back here a little bit. Um, and so essentially you click on the species name, which I will do, and then you press location there, which I will also do in a second. <laughs> and then you can zoom in and you just press tap anywhere on the screen in order to add a pin. And you can do that for um, any number of individuals, any number of species you can add. You know, if there's two blooming teals, I can add two pins there, um, whatever you think or whatever you're seeing. Um, you can download your drafts. So as you can see, I have a whole lot of drafts. A lot of them are from testing out the app, um, but you can download your drafts if you think that you won't be able to submit them um, anytime soon and you're worried that something could happen. You can download them onto your phone uh, by going to your checklist, so your draft checklist, and pressing the little download button in the top right corner. Um, also, you can see all my drafts here, and I'm going to go into one of the drafts to show you how to edit your track. So um, if your tracks are bumpy, uh, so essentially um, you look at your tracks and they might bounce off a cell tower and all of a sudden you're flying into the middle of the lake or something like that, uh, you can edit them. Or um, if you forgot to stop your checklist, you know, you've driven away and um, now your track is following you down the highway, um, you can edit that as well. So. I'm gonna go ahead and um, edit my track here. Press edit track. Um, so automatically it's gone to where I am now. Um, and so what you need to do is you need to zoom out um, and find where your track is. So that's what I'm about to do here. I'm zoom out and I gotta 
fly over to Ancaster where we did our kickoff. And this is my track from the kickoff. So you can see um, there's some jumpiness there, uh, some, you know, that look unlikely. I'm, I don't walk in that straight of a line as you'll see quite soon when I start adjusting it. Um, and so you can adjust the accuracy. So as I start to pull the accuracy down, you can see what my track actually looked like. So you can see I don't really walk in a straight line. Um, and then you can also trim the track. So you can trim it at the start or at the end, but as you can see, my finish line uh, goes forward and back there. So that's how you can adjust your track after the fact. And you can uh, either do it from your drafts or when you go to submit your checklist, it will show up there. Okay, so our things not working as you expected. So if you start using the app and things are not working as you expected, um, the first step is to make sure that your app is up to date. So what you can do from the Nature Counts app, go to your profile page and scroll down and it will show you what version of the app that you're using. Right now we're on version 5.0.3 um, and it'll show you down here, um, Nature Counts 5.0.3. So I have the most up-to-date version here. The second thing is that if it's not working as you expected and your app is up to date, then please let us know. You know, we're always um, looking to improve the Nature Counts app. Um, the feedback link, uh, the link for our feedback form is also on the profile right above um, the Nature Counts version where it says, give us feedback. If you click on that, um, it'll take you to our feedback form. It'll ask you for your device um, type and operating system. So that's um, right there with the Nature Counts version. So it'll ask you for that info. Uh, you can either press that little copy button. So the two rectangles are one on top of one another. Um, or you can just type it out. My neighbors must be doing something crazy right now. My dog is usually not the spark thing. Okay. Last but not least, uh, please leave us a review. Um, the staff developing the Nature Counts app have been hard at work. Um, they've been giving us some really awesome improvements, some things that we've been asking for. Um, and we haven't gotten a lot of reviews since the app was initially launched back in 2021. Uh, so please do leave us a review if, um, you know, if you try out the app. And um, yeah, uh, let us know. Obviously, we love ha having the feedback. So thank you for that. All right, final reminders. Uh, the August challenge is taking place right now. It ends on the August 31st next week. Um, and it's uh, to submit photo submissions. So if you go on our website, we do have a challenge page and um, you can read more about it there or uh, submit some photos through our media submission page. That's essentially the gist of the challenge. So uh, the prize is a pair of Vortex binoculars, which is pretty sweet. Um, and then data entry deadline, of course, that's the whole purpose of this um, of this presentation today is, uh, you know, to get people's data entered before the deadline of August 31st, which Mike already mentioned earlier. So um, I won't go too far on that one, but um, yeah, with that, um, any questions uh, could be related to data entry, but could be related to other Atlas stuff. So let us know. All right. Well, we do have a few um, in the Q and A's. So I think, I'm going to go with this one first, even though it wasn't the first question asked, um, but it's right in what you were just talking about. So how do you update the app from the app? So um, you don't update the app from within the app. Uh, if you're using the Google Play Store or you're using um, the Apple App Store, you can go to your App Store um, and then um, essentially it's on your profile on the App Store. here. Pull it up. Uh, so from like the main page, I don't know if you can see this, from the main page of your app store, you see all of these notifications in the top right. Um, that's because I don't automatically update my apps. So if I click on that, um, it will tell me what apps need to be updated and you can update it from there. I'm assuming it's something similar for the Play Store, Mike? Yeah, it's, it's virtually identical. You okay. can either set it to auto update I have mine set to auto update most apps. You can deselect certain apps um, and it'll update only when you have Wi Fi if that's the setting you want. But um, that, and unless you're going to pay attention to things, I would recommend having it set to that. And that's what most people's phones are set as, as a default. But yeah, it's through the Play Store or the App Store. Awesome. Yeah. I can confirm that not having it automatically update is sometimes chaotic. So I've contemplated changing it a few times. 
All right, so our next uh, question, comment. I created a checklist using the app that includes some sensitive species. I know that precise species location pins are masked in eBird, but how do I make the checklist an entire square checklist on the app? I can edit the checklist location on the website, but the original checklist location and not the entire square location seems to be retained in the eBird checklist. I don't know yeah. who wants to tackle that one. I can handle that one. Um, so yeah, you can't. So you can't actually select an entire square in the app. That's not an option. So you're not missing anything. That's we're assuming you're doing things live while you're in the field. And and like I said earlier, we really don't want you to do entire square um, checklists because we lose that precision um, when it comes to the data analysis portion. Um, but I can understand what you're trying to do here. And if you're pinning the exact locations, then you're kind of um, you're kind of canceling out the the negative part of doing a square level list. So um, you're doing things the the way you should do it, which is you'd have to go in and edit it on the website. Um, that's currently, if you have anything you notice in the app when you submit it, once it's been submitted, you can't fix it. You can't change it on the app. You have to go to the website to edit a checklist and that includes the location. Um, if you have things set to auto share to eBird, what I tell people is if you are, if you do have a sensitive species that you don't want to go to eBird or you're worried about it, um, I would su suggest don't submit that checklist right away um, and then go into your account and turn off that auto share feature within your profile um, and then submit it and it won't go straight to eBird right away. But um, it, to, to do what you're trying to do, what you can do is you've gone in, you've, you've edited the location in the, the Nature Counts website. And then you have to click the individual share button to send it back to eBird. And that will update the checklist on the eBird side of things. It's not a, it's not a live back and forth thing. Um, it's just a once when you submit the data through the app, it sends it to eBird. Um, and then if you make any changes, it doesn't automatically go over to eBird unless you click that, um, that submit button to, to update it. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um... So this uh, person, I have been doing each point count individually, not as a group entry exercise as Mike showed. Is that okay? I like the individual point count entry checklist as I can track my records more easily. I can also add site conditions and features such as weather, forest cover, agricultural land, et cetera. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, sorry, Mike. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, we really just showed this as a way for you to save your own time. And so if you're okay with putting it in so that each one has its own list, then that's great. Uh, it makes it easier for you to find it in your data forms too, because obviously each one is kind of named for its own point count. So um, yeah, that's great. Um, it sounds like a very detailed information that you're collecting. So keep going. All right. Well. Oh, we've got a few in um, from Facebook. Um, when dealing with rarities, what is the best way to note it in your summary? My example is a juvenile golden eagle um, is marking it as an X observed with an explanation of where and when seems sufficient. Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. Um, so in terms of what we want in, the, in that comment box, um, for for species that are rare, whether it's um, you know provincially rare or regionally rare breeding species, we want a few pieces of information. So we want to be able to um, attempt to verify that the identification is correct. That's our that's our first thing that we're trying to verify from from the information provided. So so for a species like that, we need to know uh, how you identified it. What were some of the similar species? that uh, you considered, how did you eliminate those, things like that. So a little bit of documentation about how the species was identified. Um, if it's a breeding record, um, then, we, then we also want to have information about um, how did you come to the conclusion that it was a breeding bird? What, like some more details about the breeding evidence you observed. Um, sounds like in this case, you're just talking about a, a, a golden eagle that was in an area, it wasn't necessarily a breeding species. 
those, I mean, from a, from a bird atlas perspective, we're not that concerned about those records in the atlas if it's not a breeding record. Um, but if you're doing it into something like eBird, they want the same information that we would um, as that first step to verify the species. So um, field marks and, and similar and, and uh, confusion species that you would have considered. All right. Just looking to see if we have any other questions coming in. So other one from Facebook about audio recordings. Oh, there it is. Um, I did audio recordings for multiple squares and sent the data to be transcribed by experts this winter. Will the data be shared to my checklist? And how does that information get shared? Yeah, so I can answer this one and I got my own ready because I did, I've also done some digital point counts and so um, did audio recordings. Okay, yeah, so I'm assuming this means as digital point counts, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so essentially what happens is, um, okay, so online on Facebook. Um, so essentially what happens is that the data gets transcribed and it's in wild tracks and then that gets um, sent back to nature camp. And so I'm just going to share my screen here. And OK. Um, and you're seeing, I'm assuming, my browser. Right? Yep. OK, great. Um, and so these are all uh, digital point counts. You can see that this one says wild trout specifically on it. So it gets shared to your account. Um, and then if I go into this one, for example, and it's uh, off-road point count, um, but it shows you all the birds that were um, reported on that digital point count uh, based on the person that transcribed it. So all of this will get shared back to you. It will show in your data forms. So under my data and then view data forms, um, and then uh, they'll all show up as point counts. Um, in your data form. So you'll be able to look and see uh, what was found. And it will also, um, if I'm, I'm going to go to the Atlas data summary, and then participant stats. So under the participant stats, there's actually a point bioacoustic column here. Uh, so that's how uh, it will be reported. It will show the number of bioacoustic points that you have done as well. So those are digital point counts. Uh, so yeah, it'll show under your data forms and it'll show under the summary as bioacoustic points. Awesome. All right, we have a couple minutes left. So are there any other burning questions out there um, before we... Did you see anything else from the, on the line? Yeah, yeah just, I just saw the... Uh... A follow up on that question on Facebook. Um, yeah, the the timeline that we're working towards is the data. As long as they get in before the end of August, those audio recordings, then they'll get off to the contractor who is going to do the data analysis, the interpretation, um, and then come back to us sometime late winter, early spring, uh, for incorporation into the atlas. Awesome. All right. Anything else? Anyone else have any other burning questions? Got Mike and Kaylin here right now. Um, but the, they're always welcome to have an email sent to them or uh, if you think of something afterwards, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to the team. People are happy to help and, and um, you know, Mike launched data, so he'll help you get we, it in there. Yeah, we, we want it. it right? Yeah. <laughs> And there's the discussion form as well um, under get involved. There's the discussion form link, um, which is a great place to to go and ask questions as well. Yes. Sometimes you get a faster response than than Kaylin and I can offer you by email. Excellent. Yes, I I you've lit a fire under me. I have a bunch of data entry to get done. All right. So it's not necessarily well. From the park's perspective, we've, we've done a lot of bird survey work, so we've got to get that information in. So, um, well, I guess it's eight o'clock. Yeah, Great. thanks, everybody. Yeah, so thanks, thanks so everyone, and thanks, Sarah. Oh, no, it's my pleasure to be here. So um, we're back again in, in, in a few weeks, right? In September. 
Um, we'll be back with another SAPI hour and good luck to everybody getting your data entry done. Um, you know, August 31st is coming way faster than I'd like it to. So uh, we'll see everybody soon. Bye, everyone. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.